Hey everyone, I'm Shah, and in this video, I'm going to share what I learned talking to top data science freelancers on Upwork. So this journey started about eight months ago for me when I began my search for mentorship. I was looking for people on LinkedIn that operated in the intersection of data science and entrepreneurship. While I had a little bit of success with this, it mainly consisted of people not responding or ghosting me. And I don't take this personally. I actually kind of expect it because I feel the ideal mentor for me is someone that owns and operates a business in the data science space, and they probably don't have time to be talking to complete strangers on LinkedIn. However, game changer for me is when I took my search off of LinkedIn and onto Upwork. And for those who are not familiar, Upwork is a platform for freelancers. Basically how it works is clients post jobs on the platform, and then there are freelancers that can apply those jobs and submit proposals. So the big realization for me is that entrepreneurs are on Upwork. While on LinkedIn, you'll definitely find serious data scientists and other people that work in the data space. Most of the professionals you find on LinkedIn are not entrepreneurs. And that's simply because of the fact most people are just not entrepreneurs. But that's not the case on Upwork. On Upwork, everyone's an entrepreneur because freelancing and consulting is a business. So this little switch of just moving from LinkedIn to Upwork for looking for mentors unlocked a whole new range of possibilities. So this kicked off a series of 10 calls with top data science freelancers on Upwork. I structured the calls into three parts, which was past, present, and future. Basically, what got them into data science? What got them into freelancing? How do they operate now? How do they get clients? And where do they see this going for themselves? What's their vision? I'm gonna structure this video in a similar way. I'm gonna walk through some of the key questions I asked in these interviews and summarize and synthesize the responses I got from all the different freelancers I talked to. And if you enjoyed this content, please consider subscribing for more videos on data science and entrepreneurship. And if you have any questions, please feel free to drop those in the comment section below. I do read all the comments and try to answer all the questions that I receive. So with that, let's get into it. So the first question was, what got you into data science? And one of the most remarkable things that jumped out at me through these interviews is that every single one of the freelancers had a different educational background. So I'm just going to list off some of these backgrounds. Biomedical engineering, industrial engineering, biostatistics, electrical engineering, computer science, finance, physics physics, data science, marketing, AI, economics, math, an MBA, and a data science boot camp. So I listed off 12 things there, and there were only 10 interviews. And that's for two reasons. One, most people had training beyond just a bachelor's degree, whether that was a graduate degree, master's degree, PhD, or some kind of boot camp or something like that. But the second reason is what I said at the top. No two of the 10 freelancers had the same exact trajectory. Maybe they did bachelor's degree in computer science, but then they did a master's in statistics. And then someone else may have done a bachelor's and statistics, then they got their PhD in biomedical engineering. My big takeaway from this is that there is no correct trajectory or journey to get into data science. And this theme of diversity, no two people fitting into the same exact mold, was a theme that I saw coming up over and over again during these interviews. So putting this simply, it seemed like different was the norm here. So the second big question was, how did you start freelancing? And again, in keeping with this different is the norm norm theme, everyone had a unique story to tell. But there were still two things that seemed to come up over and over again, which was when people were first getting started, there was a strong focus on learning and building a reputation. And so when I say learning, this is more than just the hands-on keyboard work. This is more than just the technical side of data science that people had to learn. It was also the business side of freelancing and entrepreneurship, which is you got to worry about selling yourself. You got to worry about finances. You got to worry about juggling multiple projects and clients. So that's what learning means here in this context. And the second point of building a reputation for any business, having a history of positive reviews and testimonials makes it a lot easier to get new clients and grow your business. And so when first starting out, a common strategy is to do a high volume of relatively small projects. And this helps with both of those points that I mentioned earlier. One, since you are doing a lot of projects, you have the opportunity to do a lot of reps and explore the space and learn as fast as 
possible. And two, if you're working with a lot of different clients, you in turn have a lot of opportunities to get client testimonials and positive reviews. And so while this small and wide strategy seemed to be great for getting started, it did not seem to be a common or good long-term strategy. Which brings us to the next question, how do you operate now? And so again, different is the norm here. People were all over the map. So we had people freelancing full time, we had people freelancing part time while trying to build a business or generating income some other way. We had people working full time and freelancing on the side. There were people working full time in a contract role as a 1099 employee. Also, there was someone that was transitioning out of freelance into a full time W2 role. So to me, this really highlights the flexibility of freelancing. There are so many ways Ways you can fit freelancing into your work in a way that aligns best with your long-term goals. But for those who are not seeking full-time work, whether that's W-2 or 1099, it was common to try to constrain weekly time commitments to each client. And so typically what this would look like was constraining the amount of hours for each client to between five to 20 hours a week, where 10 hours a week seemed to be a pretty good sweet spot. And so with this way of allocating time, freelancers would typically have two to three clients at a time. The next question was, how do you get new clients? From these interviews, there were three common ways of getting new clients. The first and most common was applying to contracts on Upwork or other freelancing platforms. The second way was inbound leads. Essentially, clients would find the freelancers and request for them to submit a proposal. So a key driver of these inbound leads was the reputation a freelancer had on Upwork. Did they have a high job success rating? Did they have a long list of positive reviews and testimonials? These were the types of things that would drive that traffic. And then the third way, which was common among the most experienced or those who have been freelancing the longest, is operating on referrals alone. And so typically this happens when the freelancer has a great reputation, but also builds really strong relationships and does really good work to where their clients become their biggest advocates. And so this is really like the ideal state of a freelancer because you don't have to worry about sales. You don't really have to worry about marketing. You can just focus on doing a good job and building strong relationships and your work will speak for itself. And this brings us to the final question I asked in these interviews, which is, where is this going? And again, different is the norm here. 10 freelancers gave 10 different answers to this question, but I'm gonna put their responses into three different buckets. The first bucket we'll say is to keep freelancing and to scale up their consulting business. These were the people that said they can see themselves freelancing forever. And this makes sense. You know, when you're a freelancer, there is so much freedom and flexibility. You can work when you want, on what you want, want, with who you want, where you want, and you can turn up or turn down the volume of work you're doing in case you have other priorities. You know, maybe you want to spend more time with family or you want to take more vacation. And so it's not surprising to hear that some freelancers can see themselves doing this forever. Also in this bucket, I put those who want to scale up their consulting business. And so this seems to happen organically where a freelancer starts getting more work than they can do alone. So they start finding subcontractors to help them fulfill this work. And this can naturally transition into a more structured and formalized business. So the second bucket of long-term goals I'll say is to generate passive income and to build a product-oriented company. Although freelancing can be very lucrative and you have so much freedom and flexibility, at the end of the day as a freelancer, you're trading your time for money. Basically, I pay you to do a job for some hourly rate. So while trading time for money isn't so bad, many people will prefer to trade a little time for a lot of money. So for example, build a product once and sell it many times. That's the common thread in this bucket here, trading a little time for a lot of money. And so that's why I'm lumping together, generating passive income and building a product oriented business. So some ways the freelancers talked about doing this was to develop digital products or sell courses online. There were others who were actively trying to build trading bots or building other trading tools for personal use. Others were considering building software solutions for mid-sized companies, leveraging the experience they've gained and the clients that they've worked with to essentially automate a service that they've done for clients in the past. So while no one I interviewed had fully made this transition yet, it is something I'm really optimistic about. And then finally, the third bucket was people that said they want to transition into a full-time role. While there is a lot of flexibility and freedom when it comes to freelancing, there are people that eventually want to transition into full-time roles. And there was even a theme of people transitioning in and out of full-time roles. They'll work with a handful of clients, but then they'll work for 
one particular client seems to ramp up or they open up a role for them and then they spend some period of time working full time for that client and then eventually maybe they want to go back to the freedom and flexibility of freelance so they transition out of that full time role and the cycle starts all over again. So I'll read off a few reasons why freelancers wanted to transition into full time roles. One of the big ones was you can make a bigger impact when you're part of a larger enterprise and not operating on your own. Another was when you're part of a larger team working full time, there's more social interaction and opportunity for collaboration. A big one was also you get more certainty and in income stability. And then finally, there might be greater opportunities for career growth in a larger enterprise where you are working full time. So just to wrap up here, there are four key things that I've taken away from these interviews. The first one is do good work so you can operate off of reputation and referrals. If you don't have to spend so much time selling and marketing yourself, this is typically because you have such high demand. And that's a really good place to be as a freelancer because you can leverage that to ensure that the work that you do take on is aligned with your long-term goals. The second takeaway, which I haven't mentioned yet, but it's something that came up over and over again in these interviews, is to find a niche. The key to the success of a lot of these freelancers was finding a niche, which essentially made them a big fish in a small pond. My reflection on this is when you try to market yourself as everything and anything data science, it's often difficult for clients to wrap their heads around how they can use you. But if you find a niche and you're very specific on your expertise and your offering, it typically makes you a more appealing candidate to those that are seeking those services. So the third big takeaway, which I haven't mentioned yet, but is also something that came up over and over again, is to form alliances across the tech stack. So me as a data scientist, I have a really strong set of skills around data science, but there are many other necessary skill sets that come up when it comes to implementing data science solutions in the real world. So a big piece of advice I got from a lot of these freelancers was to either get exposure to the full tech stack so you can do every aspect of it. You can do the web scraping, you can do the data cleaning, you can do the database stuff, you can do the modeling, you can do the machine learning, but you can also productionalize your model. You can also spin up a website. You can also develop some software. You can develop some apps. So get some exposure to the full tech stack or form alliances with specialists across the tech stack so you don't necessarily need to know how to build a website because you have a strong partnership with someone who's an expert in that. And ideally, I think it's important to do both. Get exposure to the full tech stack and additionally form alliances with experts and specialists and these other things that you're not an expert in. The fourth takeaway is to develop a personal brand. And so having a strong presence on social media can make it a lot easier to land new clients. Whether this drives inbound leads, like clients reaching out to you, or giving you more credibility when you do apply to contracts. If you're applying to a contract to do some kind of NLP work and you have a set of videos or blogs on the subject that you can share with the client, that really helps close the deal. So I hope you found this video valuable and helpful. If you have any questions, again, please feel free to drop those in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this content, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing with others. And as always, thank you for your time and thanks for watching.